All right, Dr. Harsolia, thanks again for being with us. Why don't you give us a quick introduction about yourself and how you got to where you are today? Sure. Uh, thank you very much for having me. I'm really excited to be joining you guys. Um, so I guess just a quick uh, brief, I'll, I'll give you a brief rundown so not be too boring, but basically I grew up in Michigan um, and I did my undergraduate and medical school at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Um, and uh, Go Blue, you know, we had a, we have a, I still have a very strong affiliation. We still go back every year to, to football games and things like that over there. And then, um, and then basically after I finished medical school, I went on to do residency at William Beaumont Hospital in Royal Oak, Michigan. Um, and so we, you know, radiation oncology is a five-year residency program. So completed that. Uh, and then I went into private practice after that. And, um, and currently I am uh, in Orange County, California. Um, I am the medical director of the Orange County uh, Cyberknife and Radiation Oncology Center out here. And that's sort of my professional uh, background. Okay, sounds perfect. Okay, so the next question is, now could you give us a description about your day-to-day -day experiences in your field and what a normal workday would look like for you? Uh, okay, well, one of the things that kind of attracted to me about, you know, to radiation oncology is that we never actually have a normal workday, which is which is great. Um, you know, I, I, I like the variety of having different things, you know, every day. But I would say a typical day for radiation oncologists um, is usually, uh, you know, it, it depends. Our group is a little atypical in that we also do, you know, some a lot more procedures called brachytherapy. Um, but um, usually, what ends up happening is that we have a few days, you know, you know, um, a week. We're we're sort of an outpatient clinic-based type specialty, and so we, you know, we have, you know, our clinics generally run the kind of standard eight to five type of thing, and so usually we'll come in in the morning. Um, typical day for me will be uh, if we have some procedures, we'll we'll generally do those in the morning. Um, most of the time, we come in, kind of get ready for the day, um, and we do a, co a combination of things: either um, consultations, those are new cancer patients that are kind of coming into the department, so we'll kind of review uh, the medical records, the imaging, um, make any phone calls that we need to to other specialties. In our field, in particular, we you know, deal a lot with uh, surgeons and medical oncologists, pathologists and radiologists. So sometimes you need to get a full picture of what's going on. Uh, then oftentimes we'll meet with the families and the patients to kind of go over, um, you know, what stage their cancer is, what's the optimal treatment for their cancer, what we're planning and how we're going to coordinate with our colleagues. And we kind of come up with a plan, go over side effects and things like this. Um, those Usually those appointments are pretty long. I mean, you know, usually it's about an hour plus that we'll be sitting down and kind of talking to patients about those kinds of things. So we usually have, you know, a number of patients throughout the day or throughout the week that we kind of do that. Um, and then um, after we finish, you know, I have a, we have a fairly large team that works with us. So it's a little bit different than a traditional doctor's office that just has like the nurse in the front office. Um, we also have, you know, physicists and dosimetrists and a lot of, um, you know, technical folks, therapists and things. And so together we will, you know, develop, you know, the patient plans. Um, usually what happens after that is that once we have seen a patient in consultation, um, we will uh, typically do what's called a simulation where we plan the radiation treatments out. And it's sort of like a MacGyverish type thing where they come in and in the modern day they get scanned and we create sort of three-dimensional reconstructions of their internal anatomy. And we kind of figure out the best way to target the tumor while sparing, you know, radiation dose to the organs. It's kind of like surgery, but without any cutting or anything like that, you know. And, um, and we work with, with physicists and, uh, um, you know, technical folks to kind of calculate tissue densities as the beams are going through and this kind of thing. The other thing that we do is during that simulation, um, and the reason why I say it's MacGyver is we figure out different ways to immobilize the patient. So, for example, if we're treating a brain tumor, they'll make a mask for the patient in the shape of the patient's face. And, you know, we come up with different contraptions to kind of replicate, you know, the treatments. And, you know, there's lasers and optical sensors and all these things to kind of make sure patients are sitting up. So we usually have a typical day. You know, we'll do consults. We'll have a scattering of what are called these simulations throughout the day. Um, the other thing that usually gets onto our schedules is follow-up patients, like patients who've already been treated for their cancer, and they're coming back for surveillance to make sure the cancer doesn't come back or to kind of manage side effects. So we usually see a number of those types of patients throughout the day. And then in between there, we have two other things. One is that 
uh, we do what's called treatment planning, which is, you know, after we do the simulation, coming up with actual treatment plan for the patient um, in terms of the radiation plans. Um, and that involves us, you know, outlining the tumor, looking at, you know, uh, like PET or MRI scans and fusing them to the imaging studies. Um, and then, uh, of course, these, these uh, procedures where we actually put radiation directly into the tumor, um, which is called brachytherapy. So we'll have a sort of a, you know, some, some surgical procedures. They're, they're mild outpatient procedures, small, small procedures. Um, and so at any given day, generally, we're doing one of those things. Um, once a week, we have what's called on-treatment visits, which is basically all of the patients that are currently getting treated with radiation. We see them on a single, once a week to kind of manage, you know, side effects, um, see how they're doing, how their tumor is responding, and kind of plan out the, the following week of treatment for them. And then the other thing that we do in our week is something called chart rounds, which is basically where we sit down with the entire team, with my nurses, the other doctors, the physics team, uh, therapy, and we go through all of the patients, new patients we've seen. And it's kind of like a strategy planning session where we say, hey, well, what's going on with Mr. So-and-so? Are we waiting for a PET scan? He's waiting for surgery. Is his chemotherapy finished? And we kind of go through all those. And we also review all the radiation plans that we did the previous week. And we do what's called a peer review where we kind of double check each other's work and kind of make sure that we're not missing anything. We bounce ideas off of each other. And so that's usually once a week we have that meeting, usually lasts about two or three hours. Um, and so that's kind of a typical day for us. Um, most radiation oncologists work eight to five, eight to six. Um, our group is a little bit, you know, busier. We're in a, um, uh, a, a in an area that's a little more competitive, a little bit more busy. So my typical day, I usually get home. I would say I usually get to work around eight, um, and I usually get home around seven or eight o'clock at night. So they're long hours, um, but but my weekends are off. Um, I have a lot of control over my schedule because I'm in private practice, so I can. If I need to block the schedule to go, you know, to one of my kids' events or things like that, I can do that. Um, we also, our call compared to other physician specialties is a little bit better. I mean, most of our, uh, like I take call every fifth week and I'm usually on call for the whole week, but, um, but um, most of the calls we can handle by phone. And especially nowadays with Zoom and with um, all the telehealth services, we can do most of it, you know, just by phone. Every once in a while, we do have to come in and see a patient, um, but that's less common. So from a lifestyle perspective, I would say radiation oncology is generally considered one of the more lifestyle friendly specialties. Um, so so those are those are kind of things that are I don't know if that answers your question or not, but that kind of gives you a little bit of overview. No, that answered it perfectly. And I'm glad you really went in depth about how big the planning process is and the amount of teamwork involved in the specialty and the hours too. Like, it's great to know that there are fields in medicine where you have more control over your schedule. So I'm really glad you covered all of that. Sure. So for the next question, um, in your experiences, whether it's on your journey to how you got to where you are or like what you face daily and on work days. Are there any major challenges that you've had to overcome and how did you overcome them? Uh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I think medicine in general, and this is kind of especially when you're sort of in the, I'll have to say that when you're in the, in the high school pre-med stage, it's very difficult to really know what it's like to be a doctor. And to be completely honest, even when you're in med school, it's, it's, it's very different than when you actually start residency and then we actually become an attending. So I think, you know, sessions like this are really good in terms of kind of getting a little bit of a taste of what those challenges are. And you don't even think about those things when you go into it. So, for example, um, you know, uh, you know, one of the things is when you're taking care of cancer patients, uh, one of the big challenges is, of course, that it's 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 a life altering event. Right. Most of our patients, they're just going through life, you know, going to work or you know, they're retired and enjoying their retirements. And then all of a sudden they're told they have cancer. It, it turns their life upside down. And all of a sudden they're told, oh, you need to have chemo and surgery and radiation and all these things. And it's it's shocking. And everybody kind of deals with that. It's It's a very heavy duty thing. For us, because we're doing it every day, it's like, oh, this is just Tuesday. But for them, it's like, this is, you know, a monumental change in my life, right? And so I think when you sit down and you um, discuss these kind of heavy duty things with patients, um, there is a challenge in kind of trying to uh, 
uh, you know, every patient is different and every patient's family is different in terms of how they deal with that kind of news. Um, so that was one of the biggest challenges, I think, when I went into the field is kind of how do you properly, you know, give patients hope while giving them realistic expectations and, and kind of navigating that and, and some pretty heavy duty emotional things, you know, that go along with oncology. Um, however, it is a little bit of a stereotype. A lot of people say, oh, how could you go into oncology? It's so depressing, you know, and this kind of thing. But it's really not. I mean, especially in our field in radiation, most of the patients who get treated with radiation, like 80 percent, we're treating them with curative intent because they usually only get radiation if the cancer is still localized. Um, the 20 percent that the cancer has spread to other areas, usually we're alleviating like a symptom, like they come in and say, oh, my arm hurts really bad from the cancer and you treat them and they feel better. So it's not like the doom and gloom that a lot of people associate with oncology. In fact, it's exactly the opposite. I think there's the vast majority of patients do pretty well and you actually, you know, they're very grateful and there's a lot of, you know, gratitude, I think, uh, in terms of, so there's a lot of um, satisfaction in terms of taking care of them. But, but there is a challenge, I think, navigating that. Um, there are surprisingly a lot more, and, and, and again, when I went into medicine, I never realized this, but, and, and you probably hear this from a lot of specialties, but just um, a lot of the admin type of stuff, like the, the um, paperwork, like, you know, we'll see a patient for five minutes and I joke around that as in, I have like, you know, you know, if a five minute patient, you'll have like an hour worth of paperwork that you do afterwards, um, you know, to, to document it and go into the electronic medical records and then insurance companies and all this stuff. And one of the challenges in oncology is that our field changes very rapidly, almost from week to week. There's which is also the fun thing about it, that it, you know, there's new advances and new technologies and new treatments, but the insurance companies and, and some of the authorizations tend to lag behind. And so unfortunately we do spend a lot of our day um, either uh, convincing insurance companies why a particular patient needs a, a particular treatment or going through a lot of hoops to kind of go through what's called pre-authorizations. That part of it is not fun and it's definitely a challenge. Um, the other thing is that sometimes, um, despite our best efforts, you don't always have control over your, your schedule, you know? Um, and this is just the nature of medicine. You're dealing with human beings. It's, it's not like I can just say, you know what, I'm going to put this project on hold and I'll come back later. It's an actual patient. So even if I'm on vacation and particularly in private practice, um, you're, even though like I'm quote on vacation, like if I go out of town or whatever, you're always technically on. Like if a doctor calls you, you're not going to be like, oh, sorry, I'm on vacation. I can't talk to you. You're always going to answer your phone if you're able to. Um, and even though we have colleagues that we cover for each other and things like that, um, it's still, you're almost on 24 hours, you know, a, a day, seven days a week. Um, because, you know, other doctors and other patients, they don't know that, oh, there's a call schedule and there's this and there's that and all that kind of thing. Um, the other thing is that you find that it is, you, you do... As much as you try to shut it off, you do think about your patients. Um, in the middle of the night, you may wake up and be like, oh, I forgot, did I remember to order blah, blah, blah for such and such patient, or did I do this or do that? So you kind of have that. I think that's a little bit different than other fields because you're, you know, I think um, you, you generally do have that sense of responsibility. And um, and, uh, and and they're human beings that you actually sit, you know, face to face in front of. And so you, you feel that when you're, when you're, you know, even when you're at home or other things. So, um so those those would be some of the challenges. I'm a little bit busier than I think I would I would hope to be. I I, I wish I was a little bit uh, had a little more time. I think that's probably everybody says that, and uh, um, that's that's the one you know some of the some of the things I would mention. That sounds great. Um, a lot of our professionals who've come have talked to us about the admin part of it and the paperwork. So it's really interesting that you also brought it up. So yeah. Um, so the next question is. What information do you think that high school students should know before committing to this career path? Ah, that's that's a that's a very good question. So, and, and again, and, you know, some of your other the other doctors that you've spoken to probably have already said this kind of thing, but um, but I think especially the way medicine has been changing, you know, it's constantly changing, and I, I think every generation says, oh yeah, it's getting worse than the generation before and things like this. But um, there are definitely. Um, I would say there's 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 a couple different things. One is that um, you know there was this kind of popular kind of stereotype that oh if you go into medicine you know you're going to be rich and successful and all this kind of thing. And and generally speaking, I would say that if if you're going into medicine to earn money, um, it's probably not. There's much easier ways to earn money. If you put in the same amount of hours and work and you're getting these phenomenal grades and getting into med school and going through all that, 
if you did the same amount of effort in law or business or whatever, you're going to earn just as much, if not a lot more, most likely. So I would say for people who want to earn a lot, which is nothing bad about that, but medicine may not be the best way to do it. There's probably, you can do that in much easier ways. But if you are genuinely passionate about taking care, you know, you love science and biology and, 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 and you like working with people for, I mean, there are some specialties, you don't have to, but most of the specialties, you know, if you, if you enjoy that a lot, then medicine is a great profession. Um, because, you know, you, 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 you do have a great, um, you know, you do feel very good at the end of the day, like you're making a meaningful difference. Um, and, and then you do, earn, you do earn a good living as well. Um, but the path to get there is very difficult. So it is a long and arduous path. And I don't think any, anybody will tell you any differently. You know, uh, med school is not easy. Getting into med school is not easy. Getting the grades, doing residency. So for a good portion of your youth, you are doing this. And I'd say that people who go into it saying that, okay, my life is going to start once I finish residency, once I finish med school, once I can, they are usually unhappy. You have to kind of just embrace it as a lifestyle, that this is my lifestyle. I'm going to, you know, you enjoy going to school. You, you, you don't mind. You're going to put your head down to the grindstone. Yes, there is a reward at the end. There is light at the end of the tunnel. But, you know, from like age, whatever, probably you know, high school, even 16 to like 30, you know, the, the prime youth, you are going to be through going through this grueling training. And um, you might as well just embrace it and enjoy it rather than, than kind of look at it the other way. And, but, but you have to be committed. I'd say that's, that's probably the number one biggest thing. Um, we, I, I've, you know, I have a lot of colleagues and friends and, and they say, you know, do medicine again. They say no. But once you're committed, it's very hard to, 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 to break off from it once you've already gone through all the hoops and you're in the middle of med school. That's not the time to be like, oh, you know what? I think I messed up. I'd rather be you know, a plumber or, a, or, a, or something else. Um, because you've already invested too much time at that point to kind of turn around and go back. So, so it's, it's great. I think things like this to really, you know, I would advise people follow doctors, um, you know, do the shadowing, not just to get the, you know, the volunteer credits, stuff, but to genuinely kind of get a real feel for what it's like. All right. Thank you so much for answering our ground basic questions with really thoroughly because I think there's a lot of great information in there I hope our viewers listen to but now we're going to move on to our student procured uh, questions sure. so for our first one um, it's how is radiation oncology different from other subfields of oncology and even before we started recording our meet you were talking about how not even a lot of doctors know about it so mm -hmm. how did you discover it and what made you choose to specialize in it? Yeah, that's that's a that's an excellent question. So, um, so the first thing is everybody thinks we're like radiology and that we don't deal with people. You know that we're kind of in this dark room, kind of looking at X-rays or films or whatever. And and we we couldn't be more opposite than that. I mean, I would say the people who make the best radiation oncologists and enjoy the field the most are people who really love interacting with people because you're you're dealing with patients. Number one, going through a hard time of their life. Number two, the other thing that's very different about our specialty is that we interact with many other specialties. So for a typical cancer, they'll have a surgeon, a medical oncologist, um, a radiologist who's discovered you know, the cancer, a pathologist who's done the biopsy. And so we end up getting on the phone and talking to all of these people. So you, you really gotta, you know, we, we work as a team with all of our physician colleagues, as well as our patients. You have to be a really a people person, which I enjoy interacting with people. So that's why I love this specialty. That's number one. Second thing is how does it differ from the other oncology specialties? Generally, oncology is divided up into three subspecialties. Surgical oncology, which is uh, going in and cutting the tumor out for you know, keeping it as simplistic. Um, radiation, which is our specialty, which is radiating the tumor, which has similar surgical principles in that you're you know, anatomically looking at an area where the cancer spreads and, and doing the radiation to that area. Or nowadays, there's a newer field called radio surgery, which is what I specialize in, which is basically like virtual surgery. It's like I'm um, giving very high doses of radiation to certain tumors in, in lieu of or instead of surgery. So patients don't have to have an operation. So an example of that is that if, you know, say the patient has a tumor in the brain, in the olden days, you'd have to saw the skull open, you know, go in there, remove the tumor, you know, sew the, sew the skull back up again. And then the patient would be in the ICU and recovery in multiple weeks and then out of the hospital. Now, you know, with CyberKnife and with all these newer radiation technologies, we can do, you know, radiate that tumor inside of the brain without making a single cut or incision, um, 
you know, we, 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 you know, some of the company people will tell you, you know, the patients will come in, you know, in their golf shirt, get treated, and you know, an hour later they're back home again, and 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 that's it, and the tumor is gone. I mean, it's it's really phenomenal. It's like the stuff of science fiction, and that's also what kind of attracted me to the field. You know, originally when I went to med school, I wanted to be an ophthalmologist, and I was, you know, and then when I did my rotations, I was like, I kind of missed the rest of the body. So the thing that I loved about it was that, you know, with radiation oncology, you still get specialized. You know, you're, you're a very narrow subspecialty, so you become a master of your field, but you're still dealing with every part of the body. So I'm dealing with brain tumors, breast cancers, lung, you know, GI, rectal, um, pro prostate, whatever. And so I deal with neurosurgeons, breast surgeons, thoracic surgeons, you know, um, urologists, you know, all different specialties, gynecologic oncologists. So I personally love that, that I got to, you know, deal with the whole body. The other thing I really like about my field is that it's, it's outpatient clinic, but it also has some surgical elements to it, some procedural things, which kind of is a nice mix. Um, and then the other thing is that I like the, the tech part. We, we're kind of the most um, technology heavy specialty um, in the hospital, we use machines called linear accelerators, which are generally the most expensive machines in the hospital. You know, there's a team of engineers and, um, you know, these tend to be, you know, anywhere from two to $5 million, you know, machines that, um, that have a lot of, you know, so if you like physics and if you like kind of, uh, you know, the, the science fiction kind of Star trek -y type stuff, then, then, then radiation oncology is, is an amazing field to go into. So, um, how I found it was actually, to be honest, to be completely honest, I was kind of trying to figure out my specialties. And um, when you're a starving med student, what happened one day was that they came and did the one hour radiation oncology lecture that you get in med school, which is, that's why I say you hardly get exposed to it. And at the end of the lecture, it was around lunchtime, the radiation oncologist who happened at Michigan, he happened to also be the dean of the medical school, um, happened to be a radiation oncologist. Um, and he invited all of us to uh, any of the med students who wanted to find out more about radiation for pizza. Now, I didn't know radiation from, you know, a hole in the wall at that point in time, but I was like, free pizza, great, let's go. <laughs> and so I went, uh, uh, more to get free pizza than anything else. And then when we did the tour of the department, um, I just totally fell in love with the specialty. I was like, this is amazing. This is exactly what I was looking for. And then I ended up doing more rotations and things like that. So, so I jokingly tell my friends that, yeah, if it wasn't for the free pizza, I wouldn't know about this field. <laughs> so, so that's, that's kind of, kind of how I came to it. it. Sometimes it's just fortuitous, you know, that you end up discovering these things. Yeah. Okay. That sounds good. So the next one is the name of the special specialty itself scares me as a parent. So this is by a parent. Mm -hmm. Was your family worried that there was a risk of exposure and how did you convince them or tell your parents? Yeah, absolutely. So that that's a great question. So as you can see, I've lost my hair. That's totally from radiate. No, just kidding. That's not that's not the case at all. So so um, so the dangers, the field generally, I would say there's a couple different things. One is that the amount of radiation exposure we get is actually less than, say, an interventional cardiologist. You know, they get significantly more because they're doing fluoroscopy and things like that. Um, so oftentimes the, quote, danger in the field is kind of, um, you know, the, the fields that people think are really safe may be very dangerous and the fields that are actually pretty safe are not. Um, so as you can tell, I'm kind of wearing a radiation badge on my on my label here. And, and uh, you know, the office I'm in is completely, you know, there, there's radiation sensors and things like that in here. And so in the olden days, we used to deal a lot more with radioactive material when we were placing them inside of patients and stuff. The modern radiation treatment, to be completely honest, we get very minimal radiation exposure. So, um, you know, the, the, the radiation is actually delivered down the hall. In, in a completely shielded room. And we probably get less radiation exposure than even our colleagues in the hospital and in other areas because our whole area is so closely monitored um, and there's so many precautions. So I've never really been too concerned. In fact, my badge generally leads lower than, than some of the folks in the hospital were doing fluoroscopy and things like this. So in that sense, it's very safe. For a very small subset, probably less than 20% of radiation oncologists actually do a lot of brachytherapy, which is the internal radiation. Even in that setting, um, we're outside of the room when the radiation is being delivered. Um, it's called high dose rate brachytherapy, and so we rarely get radiation exposure. The only place we get it is in something called low dose rate brachytherapy, which generally we, is, has become very uncommon nowadays. 
Um, so in, even in that setting, we have relatively minimal exposure. So um, all in all, I guess that's a long answer to your short question, but um, the, the field is very safe. Um, there's probably more risk in me getting into a car accident and driving you know, from, from my house to work every day than, than actually having radiation exposure. And in my entire career, I've never, I personally have never met a radiation oncologist who's had to retire or, or take time because they had radiation exposure problem. Yeah. Well, it's really good to hear that. Yeah. So completely safe. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So for the next question, the word cancer freaks everyone out. So in this field where one is constantly dealing with life-threatening issues, how do you keep positivity? And what can children like us, or as we're younger and going through med school, what can we do to keep a positive mind? Yeah, that's 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 a very good question. So um, I would say there's two things. You know, as I mentioned before, I think people have, you know, this kind of, you know, I'll say relatively false impression that you know your patients are dying and then you're always depressed and all this kind of stuff. I would say there's a couple of things. One is that you when you're dealing with cancer patients, they you know they are faced with their mortality and you're faced with mortality every day that it just you know every one of us is ultimately gonna die. The only difference in the cancer setting is that it's it's a little bit more front and center and you're just kind of like, whoa, wait a minute, this can actually happen. And I think as a doctor, it actually gives you a lot more appreciation of life. You know, you, you become much more appreciative when you go home and, you know, you know, I hug my, you know, I, you know, my kids, my family, spending time with my wife, with, with others. You, you, you have such a greater appreciation because you realize that can be taken away from you. you know, one day you can wake up and it's gone. So actually, instead of being depressed, I would say it almost makes you grateful at, that you have every day to live. And I think you take more advantage because you it's it's more in front of you in terms of living life to the fullest. Um, so I would say I've never felt that. Now, you do, you know, if you, there, yeah, I mean, you know, yes, there are patients you get very close to. You've been taking care of a patient for many, many years, and then they pass away. And yes, of course, it, it, it you, you know, um, that that can weigh on you. But usually with cancer, it's it's usually... Um, especially the patients you get close to, you've been taking care of them for a long time. So, you know, the patients usually have a time to prepare. You have a time to prepare. Usually there's enough sign that you know things are kind of heading south um, and, and, and you, you have time to kind of deal and grapple with it rather than a sudden, you know, like a car accident or something where somebody is just there one day and gone the next or something, you know. So it's a little bit, a little bit different in that sense. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, I, I think that you being grateful is a great way of dealing with it being appreciative, and you do have to have a balance in life in terms of answering that question. You can't let your career consume you because it can, and especially in medicine. And I, and there are oncologists who burn out. There's a lot of doctors who burn out. Um, you know, doctor burnout is like a big thing. Um, and, and you have to put those boundaries. You have to take vacation. You have to take time off. You have to put some solid. Uh, otherwise, you will very quickly burn out. And, um, and it's, it's very, very important to do that. Sounds great. Um, I really like how you talked about how you have a very positive outlook, which is really good to hear. So, yeah. OK, so the next question is radiation oncology is complex to understand for a common person who may unfortunately have to face it. How do you have those tough conversations and have you encountered times where the patient may have been too scared to go through the treatment? Yeah, yeah, that's that's a great question. Yeah, and and um, I would say that there are there we we encounter the entire spectrum. To be honest, on the one hand, we have patients who are have curable cancers, but they're too scared to get the treatment, or there's a lot of false information out there about radiation that oh, I'm going to glow in the dark or mutate or or this or that or whatever. And particularly in California, we have a lot of. Um, kind of, you know, uh, alternative medicine slash conspiracy type theory things where people think, oh, you know, if I eat this berry or this plant or whatever, it's going to cure my cancer and I don't need to, you know, do these things. So on the one hand, um, you deal with that and kind of educating people about what radiation really is. And on the other hand, you have the other extreme where people are like, I want to fight this cancer with every, you know, radiate every single part of my body. And even when it's you know, when it's when it's time to, you know, step back and say, you know what, the treatment may be worse than the, than the disease in the situation and trying to kind of 
talk to patients about, listen, this, the treatment's actually going to hurt you more than help you in this case, and then kind of balancing those things in between. So a lot of what doctors do is educate and teach patients. I think that um, a lot of doctors, if they didn't go into medicine, they'd probably be teachers, to be honest. You know, I mean, it kind of fits our specialty a lot is that, you know, you have to explain it in layman's terms, um, not use too much medical jargon in a way that a patient can understand what you're, you know, what you're trying to explain to them. Um, to kind of guide them through that process. And, and and you get better at it as you get further and further into your career. I think um, you, you begin, you know, to get more and more refined as you as you get more practice. All right. So thank you for answering all our questions thus far in depth. Mm -hmm. And we're getting close to wrapping up. So sure. I'm going to ask one last question. And it's a pretty popular question. We've pretty much been asking everyone at this point. Uh -huh. So in your field, what are the most significant changes caused by the COVID-19 pandemic? And how do you think it will affect our generation's experiences? Uh, uh, so COVID-19 was obviously like earth shattering when it came to um, medicine in particular. You know, I mean, it just, I mean, I don't think any of us would have ever predicted or, or known about this, you know, in, in general. So in cancer, the, the, the big ways that it affected us, I mean, one is that because everything shut down initially um, and patients were very scared, they, a lot of patients stopped doing screening, cancer screening. So like mammograms, PSAs, you know, uh, low dose chest CT scans, all these things that normally, you know, they would go see their doctors and you can catch the cancers. You know, generally, if you catch, obviously, if you catch the cancer early, you have much better outcomes than if you catch it later. Because of that, we're seeing much more advanced cancers that are coming at much later stages um, and, and more and more patients who are kind of, you know, needing, requiring much more extensive treatments as a result. Um, that was one aspect. The other thing is that, it, 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 you know, we have sort of standard protocols that we followed, but when COVID hit, um, everything got turned on its head. We were struggling with, you know, with our staff getting sick, with um, isolation, with how to rearrange the radiation department to get patients in and then, you know, wearing the masks and still treating people. And, you know, because some of our patients were under treatment, even in the height of the pandemic, they still had to come in. We still had to keep operations running. Um, some of the staff was very scared and kind of reassuring them that it was okay and safe to come into work and how to kind of make, manage those things. So those, those, but those won't affect, I mean, those are kind of more temporary things that hopefully as COVID clears up, you know, by the time your generation comes through, hopefully they'll have learned the lessons of that and then, you know, kind of uh, be even more equipped to deal with whatever else, you know, life throws at us. But um, one of the things that I think was in terms of long term implications is the advent of telemedicine. You probably have heard this is that we would never like the way that we're having this conversation right now. This would have been very strange, even though we're a very tech specialty. We never used to do this. Now I see my patients this way. Right. And you know, let's say if one of you were a cancer patient and they have like their son or daughter or whoever lives in New York and I'm in California, they'll log on and they'll be part of the consultation now um, with, with Zoom. Um, that has totally changed things. Also, you know, a lot of our cancer patients are sick and it's, you know, sometimes I can do a lot of, we, we've discovered that we can do a lot of things through the uh, Zoom or through the technology-based, you know, video conferencing that you don't actually have to have a, take a sick patient who's maybe throwing up or nauseous or, or weak and tired and, and bring them from home, have them go to the parking lot, find a parking spot, come down, wait in the waiting room for an hour and a half while they're waiting to see me. And then, you know, I see them and, and then I'm just talking to them and yeah, I'm examining them, but I really didn't need the exam. And then they go home versus they just log on for 15 minutes on Zoom and are able to accomplish the same thing. So I have a feeling that this technology, now that it's become unleashed, even though it was always existed, People didn't feel comfortable with it, especially our older patients. Now that everybody's more comfortable, I have a feeling that things, by the time you guys, you know, come into medicine, a lot of things are going to be done this way um, through the technology and through the video because people are so much more comfortable with it. So it's, my guess is things are going to change completely. In fact, a lot of my colleagues now, and this might even be more lifestyle friendly, even help with the physician burnout, they can even do their clinic from home, you know, and do a full day of a telehealth from home. And, and that's great. You can go see your kids you know, and jump back in, see a few patients, come back out, have lunch with them, come back. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's great. Yes, telehealth is definitely gonna, it's definitely Revolution. gonna change. Yes, yeah. for sure. 
but thank you so much oh, for coming. Sorry, sorry, Mel. <laughs> sorry, I was just gonna say it's crazy how like a couple minutes ago you were talking about how incredible the technology is in radio radiology and. Mm -hmm. Compared to that, virtual Zoom calls, like, this is so simple. So it's crazy it's just, how it was under our noses the whole time. Yeah. Oh, it was it, it was there. And, and you know, to be honest, there just, it was not just the doctors. We knew how to do every, you know, we knew how to do Zoom is not that hard to teach people. Mm -hmm. the, the issue is that the infrastructure wasn't there. Like, the insurance companies didn't, if you did a Zoom visit, they they don't they used to not even pay for it right so of course the dog you can't do it for free and so then the, you know you still have to bring you know and so there was just no incentive to really figure this out now that they say necessity is the uh, what is it is the mother of invention or whatever um now that they realize it's there and everybody loves it i have a feeling that the whole healthcare system will probably change to adopt it in some way shape or form you know yes for sure but thank you so much for coming. Your experiences, advice, and everything you told us, especially about this field, which isn't known, like you mentioned, it's mm -hmm. amazing. And I'm pretty sure our members are absolutely going to love this. So thank you so much.